Hello everyone, today I thought we'd take a look at the different locking options available to us in Ruby on Rails. This is going to be a way for you to ensure your data integrity if you're working with uh, multiple threads, I guess is the best way to look at it. Or if you have like users that are, you know, sharing the same resource where you need some form of data integrity checking. So a, a good example, well, I guess a contrived example might be, let's say you have a set of articles, you track the view counter on those articles, and you, for some reason, value that view counter more than your own life, you might want to ensure that the view counter is properly incremented. But if you have two people that visit this page at the same time, they might both have the same copy of the view counter, one person might increment the view counter and save it, then the other person increments their copy of the view counter and saves it. But their their copy was taken before the other person saved theirs. So you're stuck with two people incrementing the view counter from like from zero to one instead of the first person incrementing it from zero to one, and then the second person incrementing it from one to two. So Again, pretty contrived in that case, but there's situations where you definitely don't want, uh, you know, things to be overwritten, uh, transactions that aren't database related, maybe like monetary transactions. You want to make sure that you're locking for those. And the way that the locks work are once the lock is over, the next person who is waiting can then go. Unless you specify a specific flag, which is like a no wait flag, then you can force it to, uh, to just fail. So we'll take a look at that. So to get started, we're going to do a Rails new video and we'll pass in a dash D of PostgreSQL. This is just because uh, I think the flags for the database are going to be database specific. Uh, and there's really no point in focusing on like the SQLite database aspect if we're just going to be using Postgres in, in production, right? So we'll CD into our video, we'll generate two models. We'll say Rails G model. First one we'll call post. The post will have a title. It'll have some views of type integer. And we can go ahead and we can run that. The second one will be a Rails G model of, uh, we'll call it an article. Each article will have a title, some views of type integer, and then they'll also have uh, another field. And this is where the optimistic locking comes in. So the basic idea is with optimistic locking, you aren't expecting to have as many um, as many collisions as you do with pessimistic locking. So the way to look at it is optimistic locking, you're kind of going, ah, it'll be fine. It's not that big of a deal. In that case, what you can do is you can just say, if there is a, a collision, if two people try to update the same resource, we're just going to throw an error. And the way we can check that is we can create a, a field for our, uh, or in our database, we'll call it lock underscore version. It'll be of type integer. And uh, I forgot to do it, but what we'll do is we'll just uh, open this up in VS Code. We can then say that the lock version has a uh, default value. I'll we'll come over here. Uh, it has a default value of zero. So we come into our migrate, we come down here, we do a default of zero. So that's how we handle that. Now we can do a Rails DB colon drop because I have a video database from some other video we did. We can then do a Rails DB colon prepare to do our create and our migrate. And at this point, we can go ahead and test this. So we'll close out of here. We'll come over to the side panel. We'll come into the test directory, the models directory, and the post test. And then in here, we can get started. So really all we wanna do is create a setup method in here. The setup method will just do a post.destroy all. And then after that, we can do a test where we can say can create a post. Just like that. We'll do a do. We can then run this and we can assert that we can save the post. We can then come into our console. We can do a Rails test. We can test the test slash models directory, which will run everything in the posts and it'll run everything in the uh, in the articles directory. Now, what we're running into here is an unknown attribute body because GitHub Copilot uh, thought that it would be helpful to autocomplete that. So we'll just do a title and let's actually do a views of zero. We'll just initialize it with zero views. Let me clear this console. We'll run another Rails test and that comes back with a green dot, which means it, it worked. Now I do have the mini test extension here, which means I can just run these in my VS code, uh, which is pretty neat as well. 
So that's our first test. Now let's do something that fails. So we're gonna operate under the assumption that we have two users, they're visiting two different pages, uh, and they managed to bork something up. So we'll say uh, view counter is incremented twice, uh, and then we'll just do a do block. So we start by creating a post, just like that. We do a post.save, and then instead of doing this, what we'll do, Oops, we will grab this backspace, uh, hit enter, there we go. We'll say post one, or let's do a uh, dashboard post is equal to the post dot first. So this is our dashboard page. We'll then do a home page uh, post is equal to post dot first as well. So what you wanna look at here is, is the assumption that the users are visiting these two pages. Now what we can do in here is we can do a uh, dashboard post. Uh, let's do a dashboard post dot views uh, plus equals one. And then we'll do a homepage post dot views plus equals one. But let's come in here in between these two and let's do a dashboard underscore post dot save. And then let's do a homepage post dot save. Something like this. We can then come into our console. We can run another test here and we can see expected to actual zero because our post doesn't exist. So what we wanna do is grab the post.first and we'll just put that in there and we can go ahead and run this. So what we'll get here is the actual is one, but we expect it to. So why did our post model not update? Well, the reason is the posts right here get incremented to uh, zero plus one, they're initialized to zero, but then the home page also has the post.first, which was initialized to zero. So when it does its plus equals one, it's still zero plus one, which means we're just saving to post.first the number one. You can see here where you can run into these weird race conditions, right? So how do we get around this? Well, there's two different methods. So the first one is called uh, the optimistic locking, which is what we're gonna do inside of our article test. So in our article test, I'm actually gonna come back into the post and I'm just going to copy all of this. In our article test, can start by doing a article dot destroy all we'll come in here any place where we reference the article model or the post model we'll replace it with the article and we'll come in here and any place where we have this we'll just replace it with the word article so we have can create an article can create an article assert article save you counter is incremented twice the article is equal to article dot new article dot save dashboard article homepage article uh, dashboard article right here and right here and then homepage article right here and right here there we go refactor complete okay so we we now have this right what we expect to happen is if we run this one we get the expected two so if we run this one where we've just copy and pasted all of this we don't get an expected two we get a active record stale object error so here you can see it, it attempted to update a stale object article. That's because in our database migration, we told it that this article has a lock version, right? So this is where that optimistic locking comes in, where it says sometimes the distributed system has an oopsie. In that case, I wanna throw an error. So to get around this, we can do a assert uh, raises we can assert raises a active record stale object error. We can go ahead and save this. And now if we run this, a little bit deceptive, but now our test uh, is still going to fail. Uh, but what's going to happen is we now have this step right here passing. So we get an error, which doesn't cause us to fail, but it kind of does cause us to fail. And the reason is, we can't really assert that this raises this error when we should be handling this error. So how could we handle it? Well, let's say in an actual application, you don't expect to get a lot of these, uh, but what you can do is you can say something like, uh, every once in a blue moon, we might get an error here. Uh, in that case, we can uh, rescue the stale uh, object error by reloading the object. So we can come into here and we can do a we can do a begin we can grab this tab this over we can then do a rescue active record stale object error 
uh, home page reload, home page article dot save. And now we can try this again and go ahead and run this code. Oops, we then need to grab our uh, home page article and do our plus equals one. And then we can try this again. So there we go. So now when we get down here, we're actually getting two views. So this is the first option. It's called optimistic because you're being optimistic about this not happening all the time. Uh, but it, it's not exactly the cleanest solution. So what's the other option? Well, the other option is to come over here and instead of doing uh, whatever we just did, we can just come in here and we can do a home underscore page underscore post dot uh, lock. Uh, and then you have two options. You can either do a lock or with rail seven, I think you can do a, a lock with. Then we can do a do block. We can do an end block right here, tab this over. And now what we can do is we can take a look at this. We can go ahead and run this and we can, oops. Uh, this actually needs to be a with lock, not a lock with. So we'll say with lock like that. And we can go ahead and run this. I do apologize. It's like four in the morning. So this now causes us to increment our lock and to get our assert of two. So the key takeaway here is, uh, you know, this is obviously a lot easier to write. It's a easier to maintain, I guess. Uh, the the thing to be aware of, though, is in this case, we're rescuing when something goes wrong. Here, what we're doing is we're telling everyone to basically go up a tree if they show up and they're trying to... Uh, what we're doing here is we're basically telling everyone that it's too bad that they got things to do, we're more important, and we're just locking the database when we do this transaction. So hypothetically, if you have hundreds of these background jobs, you're running into hundreds of these collisions, it's great that you're handling it, but also it's a traffic jam, right? Everyone's waiting for the, the, the next one to get done so they can have their turn. And that's where you can do some stuff to mitigate this. Uh, I think I have a blog post somewhere uh, with the Postgres stuff. So here I have like my whole research tab for this video, in case you're wondering why I'm up at four in the morning. Uh, but what we can do here is we have this table. There's a whole bunch of different options that Postgres gives you for the isolation levels, which I think is covered in this post. I'll have a link to these resources in the video description. If I scroll down here, uh, we can see, uh, no, it wasn't actually this one. It might be this one. Uh, save with lock and block. No, it's not that one. It's this one. There we go. So the, the one to take away here is the force update no wait. So this, again, is going to be based on the database you're using, but hopefully they have, uh, yeah, they have the isolation levels here to avoid dirty reads. A dirty read might be grabbing the wrong view counter because it's been updated since then, etc. Uh, you can also set the requires new, which will give you like sub transaction save points uh, because some databases don't support that. Uh, and then you also have the uh, ability to use the joinable flag, which is covered in the next one. But let's focus on the for update no wait. Basically what this does is it says if there is a transaction lock and Postgres gets here, what I want to do is if I'm doing an update, so for update, right? No wait. If there's a transaction lock, I don't care. I'm just going to throw an error. I'm not here to fix it. So in this case, you would then have to handle the error that Postgres throws, but you're not going to be waiting, right? So that's sort of your trade off there. Now, in terms of your requires uh, requires new, that's going to depend on if you want these sub transactions or not. So for our case, we'll just go ahead and we'll add these. doesn't really matter. Uh, and then for the final one, it's going to be this joinable block. And the joinable block is kind of an interesting beast because uh, you have two different options, either true or false, of course. So false can be used to, uh, to deal with some surprises when you're dealing with custom nested transactions like it's stated here. Uh, the issue is, and I believe this is still a problem in Rails 7 according to this um, Cantor Cards uh, uh, blog post, but if we come down here, uh, yeah, yeah, problems still exist with Rails 7. Basically, you can also trigger your after create or after commit callbacks uh, if you have your joinable set to false. So by setting it to, to false, you cause it to not cause these rollbacks uh, when you are trying to update something like a, a child object. So you have like a, uh, you have a post with many comments, you go to update it, 
the post fails to update for some reason, I believe is the example here, then the comment uh, is is not going to be updated or it will be updated. It depends on how you do it, what, what your joinable flag is set to. So you you set it to false to uh, make sure that the, the transactions nested within this transaction are not discarded and therefore it will not be joined to the custom transaction. Uh, the downside of course is if you do that and you have your after create commit callbacks, those can also then continue to run. So here's sort of like your, your table for, uh, for each case. So uh, unfortunately, whenever it comes to multi-threading, if there were a best, uh, best solution to the problem, uh, everyone would just use that solution. So there are gonna be some trade-offs. It is gonna require you to do some research but hopefully, at least knowing about stuff like your with locks or your uh, your locking um, database uh, records uh, for your optimistic locks, it gives you some tools to at least start with. You can look into distributed locks uh, for more information if you're interested in looking into this on your own. I just wanted to sort of bring attention to this because I have run into this issue actually in a video the other day uh, that I was working on where I was running into some race conditions and I, I stumbled across all of this. But yeah, hopefully this was interesting. Hopefully this is helpful and hopefully I will see you in the next tutorial.